All right, we're in Matthew chapter 11 this morning. Matthew chapter 11, and we're going to be talking about packing light. As I said, this was going to be one message. And actually, according to my clock up here that nobody changed, I got time to do it because it's only 10.15. I don't have to let you out till 11.45, so we're doing pretty good. I don't think I've ever talked that long in my life. Anyway, we're in Matthew chapter 11. Before we do that, let's pray. Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O oh God, our strength and our redeemer. And we'll thank you for it in Christ's name. Amen. Yeah, I guess a lot of people's travel was sort of cut short by the pandemic. My wife's international travel was. We traveled a little bit. And then remember the last time that we traveled, you know, you, when you're traveling regularly, you sort of get used to packing just right so you don't have any problems, you know, going through security. But the last time we packed, we had two big suitcases. And my wife will always ask me when she's packed, she says, pick that up. Does that feel like that's under 50 pounds? And I'm like, yeah. They're under 50. So we took both of these suitcases, and she says, do these feel like they're under 50 pounds? And I think mine was the one that felt a little heavier, and I go, well, man, I, I think they'll be okay. So, of course, we're in line, and everything is slower now after the pandemic, and so there's a big line of people at the airport, and we go to check in, and I put her bag up, and I'm, and you know how you watch it go up, it's like 30, 40, 45, 46, 47. I was like, so then I got mine. 30, 45, 46, 47, 49, 50, 52. And I went, oh. and Pam's like, quick, quick. So I don't, if, I don't, has anybody ever had to do this? You literally take all these things, and we're unpacking stuff in the airport, trying to move things over. And we're like telling people, go by, go by. And, and it's kind of embarrassing because you're taking all of your stuff out in the middle of the airport. Like, and we didn't even move to the side. Like we didn't even go off to the side where you like, we were like, you know, taking this stuff. We, so we got it all together and we put it back on. And sure enough, both of them were right at like 48, 49, whatever it was. And we were able to get on. But you know what happened? We held all the traffic up behind us. People were having to get around us. It was embarrassing. We were, we were nervous. We were sweating because we had way too much stuff. How many of you ever go away? You got all the baggage and the luggage with you. And you go, man, I packed way too much for this trip. You know, you wear, you wear half the clothes that you had, and you're like, I could have got by with so much. I really didn't need the, a third curling iron with me, you know? I didn't need all of this, all of this stuff, because we carry so much baggage. And when you have all that baggage, and you're having to carry it too far, it just gets heavier and heavier and heavier. What a metaphor, as I said in our video, for life. We, this happens to us in life. We are carrying so much baggage with us and we keep adding to it. We don't take away and we keep getting more and adding more and more and more and we keep going and we try to pull it and we're so worn out from carrying all of this stuff with us. And I thought about some of these things that we carry with us through life. Let's see if any of these ring true with you. We carry our defeats. You, you know what I'm talking about when we talk about our defeats, our personal defeats that we've had, our personal failures, where maybe we failed other people, we failed in our finances, we failed in our career, we failed in other things, and we carry these defeats with us, and, and they plague us. And it seems like they come up at the weirdest times. We're not able to let any of them go. We just keep thinking about defeat after defeat after defeat, and we have another defeat, and we put it in the suitcase, and we're carrying this suitcase of defeats with us, and it keeps getting heavier and heavier and heavier. We never take anything out. And then there's, then there's the other suitcase of our demons. Now I'm not talking about true demon possession. I'm talking about the demons that we carry with us. The stuff in the, in the dark of the night, where we think about those habits that we have that maybe nobody else even knows about, that we keep hidden from even maybe those closest to us, or we at least try. And we, we add those habits into this suitcase and we, we pack them nicely and we know who we're there and we can't seem to, to get rid of them. Then there's the, add the addictions in. We all have our addictions of different kinds. You could be addicted to Netflix, you know. And, but we ever notice how you think your addiction is not as bad as somebody else's? Oh, I'm, I'm not that bad. At le and we usually start it with, well, at least I'm not blah, 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 blah. But we have our addictions and we pack them into, the, into that suitcase 
And then we add on top of it what causes, what, that's behind all of this, it's that demon of shame. Because we're ashamed of those habits. We're ashamed of those hang-ups. We're ashamed of those, of those things. And we keep adding more shame and more shame and more shame. And then we have another suitcase that we pick up and we take with us. And it's all the damage, the pain that has been caused to us. There's that relationship that went south, that somebody that hurt us. There was that, that church that hurt us. Or there was a pastor that hurt us. Or there was a church member that hurt us. Or there was a spouse or a mother or a father. And then we add abuse on top of it and all of these other things. And so we, we add all of that damage and that pain that has been, been leveled against us. And we put it in the suitcase, and then we add in the pain that is not only on us, but the pain that we have caused to others and how we failed them. And we add that in, and the next thing you know, we are walking through life barely able to move. I don't know whether I've hit anybody yet. I could go on, but I think I'll leave it because I probably hit everybody at some point. I know I hit me. And you know what? You know what those demons and defeats and that damage does? It drains us. It's so heavy and it's so burdensome and it's so painful. But we can't let it go. And why is that? Why, why do we carry that stuff with us? Why do, we, why do we try to, to, to rearrange the stuff so that we can carry the more balanced weight and not get rid of some of this stuff? Why, why do we do that? I think, first of all, we think we deserve these defeats and these de demons and the damage. We think we actually deserve it. Somebody's told us, oh, no, you deserve that because of who you are. You deserve, you're never going to amount to anything. This is who you are. You deserve this. And we believe that ourselves. We believe that we deserve to struggle with this stuff and to carry this stuff. And it's just the weight that we're going to have to bear. And when somebody else puts more on us, we just say, well, that's just what I have to do. That's just the way it is. I deserve this. After all, I did this and this and this. We feel like we deserve it. The other, the other thing is I think that we that we actually uh, need it. You say, I need this stuff? Yeah, because think about it. It's our comfort zone. We don't know what it would feel like to unpack it. We wonder if those hurts and that pain and all that stuff is there, that, that if we let go of it, we don't, we don't know what we're going to do, and so we just hang on to it because, after all, in our society, no pain, no. Right. Pain, pain is just weakness leaving the body. So we actually need the pain. We've come to believe somehow that pain equals love. Pain doesn't equal love. The only thing pain equals is pain. But we need it. Why else? I don't think we really know how to get rid of it. Churches certainly haven't helped us. This is probably one of the lines that you're going to hear from me throughout this is a line that's going to govern this sort of series that we're doing. The Jesus that people lead with is not the Jesus that we should have been left with. Let me say that again. The Jesus that people lead with is not the Jesus that we should be left with. Have you ever noticed that when people start talking about Jesus, the Republicans think that Jesus is on their side, the Democrats think that Jesus is on their side, the Socialists believe that Jesus is on their side, the Communists, well, I don't know whether they believe Jesus is on their side, uh, the Baptists say, no, Jesus is on our side, the Methodists say, no, Jesus is on their side, the Pentecostals say, no, Jesus is on our side, and people will use Jesus as a battering ram. And what we have done is we have taken Jesus through the filter of our denomination, through the filter of our training, through the filter of what somebody else has told us. And that's why sometimes when I say things in here, and I'll do a sermon where I tell you, no, that's not for us. That particular passage, unfortunately, you have printed up on your, on your wall. That wasn't written for us. People go, oh! But that's how you were taught. But see, the problem is that Jesus that people lead with is not the one that he meant to leave us with. 
if we really look at the Jesus that we're left with, it's a whole different ballgame. And we see his heart in this passage of scripture this morning. And it's mind-blowing when you look at it. By the way, this particular passage, <laughs> it's a bumper sticker. It's been knitted on pillows. People have put it up on signs. Taken out of context sometimes. And we're going to look at the sheer, not only power, but really how Jesus turned everything on its ear in Matthew chapter 11. We're going to begin in verse 25 in just a moment. Let me give you some background as to what has happened. Jesus has talked about two things before this, John and judgment. He's talked about John the Baptist, and he will give in Matthew that second time, he will say that, you know, where we talked about Jesus was eating with the, the publicans and the really, the, like there was the sinners. We looked at it in our one message. It was a really bad sinners. And Jesus will talk about that. Talks about John the Baptist and, and, and he talks about himself. And then he goes after some of the places that he's done miracles in who haven't turned around and repented, who haven't left their baggage behind, who haven't said, oop, i got to physically turn around and follow this guy. And he says, look, I've done miracles and done all this stuff in front of you. He said, it's better for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment who haven't seen me when you've seen me and you're not getting it. The point is, is that there are people that can see Jesus and still not get him. You could have seen him for years and still not get him because the Jesus that people have led with is not the one that he left us with. And we just don't always see it. So I want us today, even though we may have taken this scripture passage and we've seen it before and we've read it and we think we know everything there is to know about Jesus, I want us to take that off and look at what he says. So after talking about John and judgment, in verse 25, it says, At this time now, Jesus prayed this prayer. O oh, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, thank you for hiding these things. Notice what he says, from those who think themselves wise and clever and revealing them to the childlike. Remember, Jesus always was going for the children. The disciples are like, the children are irritating. Let's keep them away. And Jesus says, unless you become like a child, you're not going to partake and enter into the kingdom. And so he says, listen, uh, the, the clever, the revealing, to, he reveals to the child like he says, yes, Father, it pleased you to do it this way. Then he says, my Father has entrusted everything to me. The good, the bad, and the ugly. He's entrusted the universe. He's entrusted the world. He's entrusted you. He knows the hairs of your head are numbered, which means he also knows about, he's entrusted your defeats and your damages and your demons and all of your drainingness, everything that's gone on. He has done that. And he says, no one truly knows a son except the father. And no one truly knows the father except the son. And then, and those to whom the son chooses to reveal him. And Jesus now is going to reveal himself in his heart. Right here in Matthew 11. Here it is. Then Jesus said to these people that are around Come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens. Now, I just want to, just want to stop here. <laughs> I love this. He says, those of you who are weary, worn out, because of your defeats, because of your demons, because of the damage that has been done to you, the damage that you have done to others, those of you who are worn out carrying all of this baggage, I want you to come to me. He says you're weary, and he says, and you're carrying heavy burdens, i.e. heavy baggage. If you got heavy baggage, if you're worn out, if you're exhausted, if you don't know what to do, Jesus said, come to me me. Don't come to the church. Don't come to the televangelist. Don't come to the book. Come to me. And then he says, and I will give you eternal life. I will give you a new church. I will give you money. In fact, you'll have health and wealth and prosperity. No. Do you see the radical nature of this? He says, come to me, all of you who are weary and carry your burdens, and I will give you rest. You know what rest means in the Greek? Rest. I'm, I'm, I'm half kidding, because we've made it say 
other things. I, I, the Baptist church, he's going to give you rest for your weary souls, which he says later, he's talking about spiritual rest. No, he's not. That's one thing. Eternal rest we talk about, but he's talking about rest. He's talking about refreshment. He's talking about ease. He's talking about literally lifting the burden. He said, if you come to me, I am going to give you rest. Now, why is that? Notice what he says. Take my yoke upon you. Okay, hold on a second now. Take my yoke. Yeah, a yoke. What's a yoke? Well, the yoke, there's two ways to look at this. There was, of course, the yoke that, that tied the oxen together. And you say, well, wait a minute. That's what put the burden on them so they could do their work. Right, because what God acknowledges is that all of us are going to have burdens and life is going to be, life is hard, but you all know that. Life is tough. We have defeats. We have damages. We have demons. We have all of these things. He knows that. And he says, I know there's going to be a yoke. Now, the other thing that, that you can look at, because Jesus was a rabbi, is every rabbi had a yoke. They had a, they had a, a group of teachings. But here's the thing. Jesus' teachings were going to be different. Because the rabbis of his day were teaching 600 plus commands. Think about it. Nobody could be perfect enough. No, you got to do this, you got to do this. Okay, oh, I just mixed this with this. I can't do it, I've sinned. Oh, I went over here and I picked this piece of grain and it's the Sabbath. Oh, I've sinned. Oh, I didn't wash my hands before I ate. Oh, I've sinned. Everything that they're doing, they're sinning because, and, and so they're not living up to, to the standard. And so they're being told constantly how wrong they are. And the yoke keeps getting heavier and heavier. And people, the religion was putting more defeats and giving them more demons and giving them doing more damage. And, and the yoke is getting heavier and heavier and heavier to to the point that they, can't, that they can't bear it. And Jesus says, take my yoke upon you. Here it is. Let me teach you. The Jesus that people lead with is not the Jesus that he had intended us to be left with. You know, I find it interesting when we talk about Jesus. I, you know, I back up a little bit. I love certain people in history. Lincoln, I've read so much stuff about Lincoln. There are, there are biographers that just talk about the Gettysburg Address, and there's 300 pages about the Gettysburg Address and the four, the four different copies and what may have been left out and what was included in copies later and Edward Everett and everything that went on that day and how he spoke for an hour and a half and Lincoln only spoke 270 words. There's all this history. and There's always new biographers. I love Churchill. There's always a new biography of Churchill coming out, all giving a different perspective. Have you ever realized that the Gospels are the biographers of Jesus? Have you ever looked at it like that? Have you ever noticed that when you find a biography, you grab the biography because you want to see their lifestyle. You want to see what made them tick. You want to learn from them. And Jesus says, listen, follow me. I want you to learn from me. Let me teach you. And then he says, because this, listen to the radical difference of this, because I am humble and I am gentle at heart. I'm not putting more burdens on you. I'm not trying, I'm not trying to do more damage. I'm not trying to raise those demons up so that, so that they overtake you. I'm not trying to make you feel defeated anymore and I'm not doing this for my own ego I'm not doing this to just say oh everybody's saying rabbi how wonderful you are oh you're so great rabbi that's not it he said I'm humble and I'm gentle of heart and then he said this and you will find now here it is rest before now he says you're going to find rest for your souls you know why because those defeats and those demons and that damage doesn't just crush you at the emotional level. It crushes you at the soul level of who you are. And he said, listen to this. If you let me teach you, if you take the yoke off that's burning you now and you put my yoke on you, it's going to fit you perfectly. That was the thing, Mike. Sometimes they would put, you know, oversized yokes on the oxen. It would chafe their necks. And Jesus says, I've got a yoke just for you, designed just for you. It's not going to be overbearing. Just, you just have to follow me. He says, and I tell you what, when you do this, you're going to find rest for your souls. All of this stuff that you have been, you've packed is going to be left behind. And then he says this, 
Nobody likes to talk about this because we like to talk about sacrifice. We like to talk about discipleship. We like to talk about following Jesus. And it's going to be hard. For my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden that I give you is light. Can I just say something? If your religion and your following of Jesus is just hard and arduous and grinding, that's a different Jesus. As hard as that is to admit, that's not the Jesus that he wanted to leave us with. That's the Jesus that other people have led with. We've missed it. Why? Because we don't know what to do to get rid of the bags. We don't know what to do with this. It, it's interesting because uh, John Mark Comer, who's a pastor in, in, uh, in Portland, Oregon, says this, you cannot experience the life of Jesus, <laughs> listen to this, without adopting the lifestyle of Jesus. That doesn't mean you've got to wear a robe and grow a beard and walk around and, you know, you can't drive anywhere. It's not that. But what was his lifestyle? I don't think we truly understand it. Why? Because we've got our systematic theology that we've made him fit in. We've got our, we've got our denominational uh, perspectives that we've made him fit in. We've got all of these things that we've made him fit in. We've tried to organize Jesus instead of letting Jesus organize us. He says again, you can't experience the life of Jesus without adopting the lifestyle of Jesus. See, this is a call for us to follow him and literally to say, okay, I'm taking this yoke of all the damages and all the defeats and all the demons and I'm literally taking it off and I'm setting it down because I'm about to go through a turnstile. You ever had to go through a turnstile with a bunch of luggage? Turnstiles are irritating. They only let one person through at a time. And then if you back up, you go, and then you stop. You ever had that happen? Or you got all this stuff, and it's like, and, and there's a, a few turnstiles, but you got all these bags, and you're like throwing them all over because you can't, you're trying to carry all this stuff, and you got to get through. And one person at a time going through the turnstile. But the turnstile says, I'm going from one thing to the next. And what Jesus says is, listen, if you want this new lifestyle, and you, you've got to walk through the turnstile, but you can't take the damages and the demons and the defeats with you, because I've got something totally different for you. At some point, we have to, as the song says from Frozen, let it go. You can't walk through the turnstile with all of that. Why are you hanging on to the defeats, to the demons, and to the damage when there's something that's so much better? Ask yourself today, is the Jesus I've been led with, that people have, have shown me, is the Jesus that was meant to be left with me? And challenge it. What's his lifestyle? Read it for yourself. And the biographers of Jesus, you say, well, that's, you know, you'd call them biographers. They're the gospels. Right, they are. They're good news. They're inspired. I'm not eliminating that at all. But if you reduce it to that, these are the people that lived with Jesus and told us exactly what he did. It's amazing because, because people will go and they'll, they'll, they'll watch like a work, if you, if you like to work out, they'll find somebody that's got a workout plan and they'll follow that and they'll, they want to know what the person eats and what the person drinks and when they eat and when they go to bed and when they wake up because they want to model their lifestyle because they want to look like that. See, people do it. They go to a Tony Robbins seminar. Tony walks on fire. They're going to walk on fire. They want to know when Tony gets up and how he breathes and what he eats. and They want to do all that because they want to, do, they want to have what he has, so they want to model his life. None of that stuff works until you come to Jesus. This is a call to what we used to call discipleship. But you know what I think a better word for it is? Because people, a disciple sounds like it's hard. It's apprenticeship. It's learning from him. It's learning about life from him. We all need a mentor. In this case, he's a divine mentor. He just says, I need you, if you want a new lifestyle, to walk through the turnstile and follow me. Follow how I did it. And be willing to leave all that other baggage behind. It's interesting. I said I was going to read at the end another translation of this. It's actually a paraphrase. If you've never read 
uh, the paraphrase of the Bible called The Message by Eugene Peterson, you've missed it. I'm telling you, it is so, so good. Peterson spent years as a Greek scholar, especially in the New Testament, paraphrasing it in a way that we would understand it. And nobody has put a translation or a paraphrase better of this passage than Eugene Peterson. And I'm going to close with this. It'll speak for itself. Are you tired? Worn out? Burned out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me and you will recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Then I love this next line. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. Did you hear that line? Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. You know, like the others. You know, like you've done to yourself. Keep company with me. Not with them. With me. And you'll learn to live freely and lightly. Wow. And that's what we're going to talk about over the next three messages from today. Let's pray. Father, we thank you again for the truth of your word. God, may we this week really look at the Jesus that others have led with, may not be the ones that you meant to leave us with. May we uh, anew walk through the turnstile today to say, I got to leave this stuff behind because all it's doing is burn me down. I got to pack lighter, but allow you to pack the suitcase for me. Allow you to put the yoke on us. May we take the one off today, walk through the turnstile, and let you put the one on us that you meant to. And may we adopt the lifestyle that you have for us. Teach us over these next three or four weeks, we pray. And God, may we live this out as we go forth from this place today. And we'll thank you for it in Christ's name. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all, both now and forever. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed. Make it a great week.